This is the VIC-20 that I bought when I was 16. At that age I didn't have a lot of money and couldn't really afford to buy software back then. I don't contone software piracy now of course, but uh, back in 82 and 83 my 16 year old self didn't really think twice about it. Most of my software back then was either copied from friends, typed in from magazines, or written myself. Most games for the VIC back then came on cartridge. It's easy to copy a tape, but uh, how do you copy a cartridge? Well, it turns out you can, but it's kind of tricky, especially if you don't have a floppy drive and you need to save directly to tape like I did. This data set here was all I had to load and save programs with at the time. I wanted to make this video because I've seen a few people asking how to use CRT files on a real VIC, and just for the fun to go through the process again myself and remember how I used to do it 37 years ago. Back then we called them ROM saves. You copy the contents of a cartridge to disk or tape and then load it back into a RAM expansion module in the same address space. You need some hardware to do it though. If you turn on the computer with the cartridge plugged in, you're stuck in the game and you can't save anything. I do remember some people back then who would try to very carefully plug in the cartridge while the computer was already on. That will usually cause it to crash and can cause damage, so that is not recommended. You need an 8K RAM expansion cartridge to load the game into after you copy it, and you need something like this. This is a knockoff copy of a cardboard three slot expander. It lets you plug in more than one cartridge at a time, but more importantly it has these switches that enable or disable the address select lines, so you can stop the cartridge from running automatically when you power on. I forget where I got this one, but it was probably from somebody at a users group meeting. The PCB looks homemade and uh, it's been damaged here and there by me making modifications to it before I knew how to solder properly. It's actually pretty easy to copy a cartridge to disk, but copying to tape is not easy because of the way the kernel routines for tape are written. You can't actually save anything from memory above 32K. You can save any memory to disk, but when you're saving to tape and you set the address range you want to save, if the end address has the high bit set, the kernel will think the save is done and turn the motor off. Saving to disk is pretty simple, so I'll do that first. If you want to skip ahead, I'll put an index in the description below. Now I've got everything plugged in and I've got the block 5 line enabled, so the cartridge should start when we turn the computer on. There it is, we have GORF in there. Now if I turn off this switch, which is the address select line for block 5, the computer can't see the cartridge anymore, so when I turn it back on, we drop right into basic. And then if I switch this back on again, the computer can now see that cartridge again. Now I need to load a machine language monitor. If you have Vicmon, that sits in block 3 so you can use that, but uh, for now, I'm just going to use Tinymon. since that sits in the uh, basic 3K of RAM. Now we just need to issue the save command to save the block 5 address range, which is A000 to BFFF. So S for save, file name, device number, we're saving to disk, so that's 8. Starting address, ending address. I was always taught to add one byte to make sure you get the last byte that you need to get. I don't know if that applies to disk, but I still do it. Now that's saving to disk now. Shouldn't take too long. Exit the monitor. And we have GORF there 33 blocks long. Well, that's it, it's saved. So now all you have to do is take the cartridge out, plug in a RAM expansion cartridge, and load it back up. Now let's try to do the same thing to tape. Save. Tape is device 1, and address range A. Press record and play on tape. Now 
and that's it. The tape count only moves six digits. All it does is save the file header to tape and then stop the motor. So we need another method to save it to tape. Now of course now you could save it to an SD card and then use modern tools to convert it to a tap or a WAV file, but I couldn't do that back in 83. We used a little program called ROM Save. I have no documentation on this program and no idea who wrote it. Full disclosure time, I used this program quite a bit in high school, but when I was getting ready for this video a few days ago, I could not get it to work. It's been 37 years and I guess I forgot everything I used to know about how to use it. I looked over old notes and I tried it a few different ways, but it still wasn't working. So I reached out to Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell and asked him if he could take a look at the program to see what it does. Robin made quick work of the 143 bytes of code, and thanks to his disassembly notes, I was able to figure out that the program actually doesn't have a way around the problem. It actually saves block 1, not block 5, but it spoofs the file header so that when you load it back, it loads into block 5. It all came back to me after that, and I remembered that you need to use a hardware hack to relocate the cartridge to block 1 when you save it. You can see here on this card slot extender of mine that the traces for block 1 and block 5 were cut at some point and later repaired. I think I probably had a switch installed there at some point to cross the lines over when I needed to. And because this has these individual switches, I can just put a bridge wire here between block 1 and block 5 select lines. These switches connect or disconnect the block select lines. This one turns on or off block 1 and 2 for all three cartridge slots and the rest of these uh, enable or disable block 3 and block 5 for each slot individually. Now with the block 5 switch off and the block 1 switch turned on, when the computer selects block 1 that will cross over to the block 5 select line on the cartridge and the computer will be able to read the contents of the cartridge from the block 1 memory space. You can look at block 5 in the monitor And then, if we turn off block 5, and turn on block 1, and we look at the block 1 memory space, we'll see the exact same data. Now we'll load the ROM save program. You need to load with the common one option so it loads into the correct memory. and run it using sys6144. It asks for a file name and then press play and record on the tape. Saving takes about two and a half minutes. First it sets the address range to block 5 and writes just the file header. Then it changes the address range to block 1 and writes the rest of the data. And then at the end, it always saves a copy of itself, which is kind of nice since it's machine language and sits up at the top of RAM. It's not easy to just save a copy of it. Now that it's saved, you can give the cartridge back to your friend. When you want to run it, you need to load it into a RAM cartridge. This is the cartridge I used back then. It has the cover stripped off of it so I can get access to the switches inside. If you have one with the cover still on it, you're going to have to open it up to get access to the switches. These switches here set the memory range. And when you get a cartridge, the default is block 1 so that it can expand basic memory. They're kind of backwards here. The fourth switch is for block 1, then 2 and 3 and 5. So you want to set your cartridge to block 5. And here on my slot expander, I'm going to turn off everything but slot block 5 for the last slot. Now when we load the saved cartridge, we have to load again with the comma 1 option so that it loads back into the original memory space. And when it's done loading, all you have to do to start it is press the reset button. If you don't have a reset button, you can type sys64802. Well, 
One other little thing you might need is this little switch right here, which is a write protect switch. Software publishers eventually realized that people were copying cartridges, and as a copy protection method, some cartridges will actually try to erase themselves. If they're in ROM, of course, uh, they can't erase themselves, so the game just keeps running. But when they're in RAM, they can actually overwrite themselves and crash. So, we've got a write protect switch here that only in the way that I have it wired up here, it only applies to the last cartridge slot. And in the read-only position, it simply disconnects the write enable line from the cartridge slot and pulls that line high with a pull-up resistor here. You just have to remember to put it in read-write mode when you're loading the game and remember to flip it to read-only before you start it. Of course, this is a troublesome and time-consuming method of copying a cartridge. Nowadays, you can just uh, buy yourself a penultimate cartridge and save yourself a lot of time. But it was still fun doing it the old way, just to remember how we used to. I'll put a link in the description to the ROMSAVE program itself. Uh, that'll also include schematic drawings for the uh, Block 1 and Block 5 crossover and the write protect switch. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.